So I just made a video and then I didn't want to post it. I just kind of got tired of reading through this. Um, so I'm going to go somewhere. Oh, hey, look at the dais. Dais. I was just flipping through. I saw dais in the, uh, the concordance in the back of the... Let's see. D-A-I-S. Sometimes I forget how to spell dais. Um, let's see where we can find that. Let's go to... Um, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Let's do it. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Second Corinthians 5.10, it says, For all of us must be manifested in front of the dais of Christ, that each should be requited for that which he puts into practice through the body, whether good or bad. Be aware, then, of the fear of the Lord. We are persuading men, yet we are manifest to God. Now I am expecting to be manifest in your conscience in your consciences also. This is Paul talking. So what he's saying is we all have to literally be there at the dais of Christ. There is no partiality when it comes to the completion of the body of Christ. And requited. We're going to look up that word requited. R E Q U I-T-E-D. Q-R. Re qu 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 quieted. Pay or reciprocate. Requited means, it says, see fetch. We're going to go to the word fetch. You know? Like a dog, we're going to go get it, and we're going to bring it back, and we're going to make sense, because I'm your dog. Some Iggy and the Stooges right there. I'm your dog. Fetch. Fetch, fetch. F E T C H. Requited. Recover. Bring. Receive. So we're being given something from God through Christ at the dais. For all of us must be manifested in front of the dais of Christ, that each should be requited for that which he puts into practice through the body, whether good or bad. So God has caused and put into effect everything that you have ever done, are doing, and will do. And to members of the body of Christ, that is, that's not foreign to you. That is basic understanding of God, is that he is operating all with his spirit. And he kills and makes alive. He can take the spirit from you, that you would no longer be a soul. In fact, you wouldn't exist at all, because we do not believe in the immortality of the soul. We believe that God can kill and when he kills, he takes the life from it. Therefore, it is not living. It's dead. It does not exist. You don't exist without the Spirit of God. All is from God in the first place. So. Well, 
whether good or bad. So we're gonna we're gonna realize who we had to be that we realize who we are. I don't believe there is any way for us members of the body of Christ to truly be one unless we completely realize who each other is. We realize that it is no longer I am living but Christ within, right? So we will have a mirror image. And I don't believe that there is any shame for us. There is, there is no condemnation for those found in Christ. It's not like at the dais of Christ, you're going to be exposed and you're going to feel bad about it. No, you're going to be exposed and you're going to feel understood. You will be understood by everyone around you. Because we also will be exposed with you. Whether this is simultaneous or God goes through the body one by one that we get to focus on each other and realize wow god did so much with this person so much imagine the joy the joy of christ in each of us as our brother christ jesus looks at each of us our brother paul all of you we will see each other as one another truly one i i anticipate this because we we live in a world that continually alienates us as god pulls us from the muck and sets us on a solid ground they don't like it that we are on solid ground we don't even have to explain it we don't have to talk about christ we don't have to talk about god or aeonian life at all People hate us because it is in them to hate. Just as the Pharisees who hated Christ, they had no reason to hate him other than that he was righteous and holy and was perfect and is perfect. They hated him because it was in them to be hating him. They could not do what he was doing. They were operating in flesh, and he was operating in spirit. Being aware then of the fear of the Lord, and the word fear is more so respect. It's reverence. It's realizing that God is who he says he is. And what sets us apart from all of creation is that we actually believe it. And we realize that we are subject under the capital S Savior of all mankind, our Father God. He's the living, breathing. He is, he is the breath. We are breathing and he is the breath. Be aware then of the fear of the Lord. We are persuading humans men yet we are manifest to god now i am expecting to be manifest in your consciences also so this scripture is an inanimate object but the words in it are living how do i know this because it gives you aeonian life and that's pretty much what paul is saying that the same life that is given to him, the same Aeonian life, the life of Christ, the vivified life of Christ, even in this mortal frame, we have a vivified Christ in us. Christ Jesus is vivified within us. Though we may go to repose in this terrestrial frame and die and not exist, those in repose will be resurrected from the dead and be given glorified, vivified bodies. There will be no need for these terrestrial terra firma elements as we will be manifest to God in spirit, his spirit. So what Paul is saying by, by explaining and saying, now I am expecting to be manifest in your consciences also, is that the core 
of a believer of the body of Christ is to be meditating upon and considering the words from Paul, which his words come from the glorified Christ, and the glorified Christ's words come from God. So our focus, day in and day out, is what Paul has written to the Ecclesia. It's our daily thoughts. It's our focus. It's our desire. It's our being. It is God's. It is His. We are His. We're His children. Not again are we commending ourselves to you, but are giving an incentive to you by boasting over you that you may have it for those who are boasting in personal appearance and not in heart. For whether we were beside ourselves is to God, whether we are sane is to you. For the love of Christ is constraining us, judging this, that if one died for the sake of all, talking about Christ, consequently all died. All of humanity, all mortal creation. And he died for the sake of all, that those who are living should by no means still be living to themselves, but to the one dying and being roused for their sakes. For that we, from now on, are acquainted with no one according to flesh, yet even if we have known Christ according to flesh, nevertheless, now we know him no, so no longer. So that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation, the primitive passed by, lo, there has come new. Yet all is of God, who conciliates us to himself through Christ, and is giving us the dispensation of the conciliation, how that God was in Christ, his spirit was in Christ, conciliating the world to himself, not reckoning their offenses to them and placing in us the word of the conciliation. So that is what we do. We proclaim, and we evangelize, and teach, and we uphold the truth that God is at peace and is conciliated to creation through Christ. The words from Paul that one who ought to be hearing for life Aeonian, will be understanding and thus putting forth what they have heard without any change to what the truth is. All we have to do is explain what we understand, that God is conciliated through Christ to us. And there will be very few people that understand and that's completely fine, because there is a very, very, very select group of people, the Ecclesia, the body of Christ, that will actually understand this truth, whether it be into death, or that we may see those who are in repose rise with us up to see the Lord in the air that we may not taste death and I really don't believe we will taste death and I find that so beautiful uh, if I continue in verse 20 it'll it'll state what I was just explaining for Christ then are we ambassadors as of God and treating through us we are beseeching for Christ's sake. Be conciliated to God. That's in quotes. Be conciliated to God. That's all that's what we tell people. 
be conciliated to God. For the one not knowing sin, Christ, he makes to be a sin offering for our sakes, that we may become in God's righteousness in him. So Christ did not know sin. God subjected Christ to be a sin offering for our sakes. What does that mean? Does that mean not doing what God has told you to do or doing what God has told you not to do? Let's get past the behavior and focus on the reality that focusing anywhere other than God is sin. It's missing the mark. It is not seeing God for who he really is, the Savior of all, conciliated God. So, it says, be conciliated to God. For the one not knowing sin, he makes to be a sin offering. So Christ became a sin offering. And the only reason and purpose behind this is Christ was the one being who truly saw God for who he was and is and always will be. The savior of all. The source of life. The one who kills and makes alive. Now we know that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 7, is the one that states God creates light and darkness, good and evil. He makes alive and kills. He is God. He does all these things. I don't believe Isaiah fully understood this. As Christ does. Christ understands this. Because Christ is the only being worthy to represent God. He is the true ambassador of God. And we are given over, given into the realization of who Christ is and that his faith is sufficient for all. He died once for all, for all time. So we then become ambassadors of Christ. You can tie that back to God. Yes, we are ambassadors of, ambassadors of God as ambassadors of Christ. Because Christ does nothing unless he sees the Father do it. So he is doing what the Father is doing. And if we are doing what Christ is doing, because we are made to do so, by realizing who God is, then we too are ambassadors of God. Do not, and I, I am saying this explicitly, absolutely do not skip over Christ. Without Christ, we do not know God. And that is why he had to become the sin offering. No other being ever created is worthy of representing God. Only Christ. Not even us, because we are born of Adam. Christ is not. I'm going to read this next few verses. It's going to be chapter 6. Um, just It's very encouraging, and I want to leave it on this. It says, Now working together... We are also entreating you not to receive <laughs> we are also entreating you not to receive the grace of God for not. For he is saying, In a season acceptable I reply to you, and in a day of salvation I help you. Lo, now is the most acceptable era. Lo, now is the day of salvation. We are giving no one cause to stumble in anything, lest flaws be found with the service. But in everything, 
we are commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in blows, in jails, in turbulences, in toil, in vigils, in fasts, in pureness, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the power, oh, in Holy Spirit, in love unfeigned, in the word of truth, in the power of God, through the implements of righteousness of the right hand and of the left, through glory and dishonor, through defamation and renown, as deceivers and true, as unknown and recognized, as dying and low, we are living, as disciplined and not put to death, as sorrowing yet ever rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, enriching many as having nothing and retaining all. I want to go to verse 14. It says, Do not become diversely yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what communion has light with darkness? Now what agreement has Christ with Belial? Or what part a believer with an unbeliever? Now what concurrences now what concurrence has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. I'm talking to you. You are the temple. God does not dwell in churches, in man made churches. He dwells in the bodies of those who believe who he is through Christ, which is a happy, conciliated God, Savior of all. Now, what concurrence has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, according as God said, that I will be making my home, God will be making his home, that I will be making my home and will be walking in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out of their midst and be severed with the Lord. Ooh. And be severed. The Lord is saying, And touch not the unclean, and I will admit you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. I can just keep reading this. What I pretty much just read to you is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 6. Um, it's coming to a point where the, the feigned believers, and that word feigned, really what it's saying is people who don't ever, they never did believe the truth. They just didn't want to be alone those people are being weeded out and they're not going to stick around they're not going to stand by the faith because the faith is not in them christ is not in them they can't it's like that that phrase that saying if you can't stand the heat stay out of the kitchen well those who are cooking and they are preparing food, no matter how hot it gets, they have to keep cooking. If you're not here to cook, if you're not here to actually proclaim the truth, if you're not here with the Spirit of God truly living in you, in Christ within you, you will not stay. You will not last. The fire will get too hot, and you will flee to cold, dark places. And we are not found in cold, dark places. It just said, what communion does light have with the darkness? Now, you guys know what a shadow is, right? Uh, 
let's see if I can make one. Can't. Well, you can see here. You can see right here. There's a sh there's the wire and there's the shadow. So that shadow is less light than the wall. But it is not total darkness. Like this TV, excuse me, this TV has no light coming out of it. Therefore, it's dark. We have a contrast, and we live in a, a new era of weird beliefs that the gray area is a place to be, and these feigned believers are... They're testing God. And I'm, I'm really not sure what it's like to be deceived so far as to proclaim to be a member of the body of Christ, to talk with members of the body of Christ, and act as if you're one of us when you're not one of us. Um, the difference between us and them is true members of the body of Christ understand grace. We understand that we are incapable of putting ourselves where we are. That only God is capable of doing so. Total subjection. There is this part of the unbeliever that wants to accomplish faith. And if you're an Israelite type, I say this in many of my videos, if you're an Israelite type, so be it. Go to the circumcision gospel. Learn about it. Have enough oil in your lamp by the time Christ returns. Otherwise, please stop tarnishing our name. Please stop dividing members, true members of the body of Christ with your lies, with your quote-unquote wisdom, with your belief system. Um, it hurts people who have been hurt by just about every kind of person in the world. Members of the body of Christ have dealt with affliction to a greater degree than any other person outside of the body of Christ. We know the story of Job. That guy's life was completely destroyed, pretty much. It wasn't completely destroyed. He was kept alive by God, and then he was giving... He was given like tenfold the amount of things he had before. Um, his own wife said, curse God and die. Why don't you just curse God? And Job was the most faithful of all of God's men at that time. Um, there's messengers of light among us so-called messengers of light and I don't name specifics when it comes to this stuff because uh, I I want to say that these people know who they are they're dramatic they are unable to comprehend the truth and they ask more questions than there are answers for when it comes to the focus of Christ. It's frustrating to have fellow members of the body contact me and be worrying about people who I can tell just don't get it. And the beauty is it is not up to me. It's not up to you whether or not these people understand the truth. It is completely up to God. The thing is, I don't know if they know that. I don't think they believe it. I think they want to believe it. Um, but my focus is on the body of Christ. My focus is on Christ himself. My focus is on God. And I, I just care about all of creation. I care about the entire body of Christ. And it seems there are deceivers among us in our circles that would rather build themselves up than build the body up. And I say that 
in a in a sense that they are selfish they are self-serving they are uh, they, they care about themselves more than they care about the truth when in reality we can do without you we can do without the lies and the pain and the deception and the greed and the lust and the the immorality the the wicked teaching the brokenness the evilness the twisting of the truth. And it's... I know that I don't need to name specifics because at the days of Christ, we will see who the true members of the body are. And at the consummation of all in all, and at the great white throne, both of those times, we will see who is who. Um, I just don't understand how people can spend so much time with people that they don't agree with but lie to themselves so much as to fit into something that they don't like. Or maybe they're just on a constant high. They're chasing a high. Whereas, because uh, you guys know this, there's people who love what you have to say about the truth and as soon as you stop talking, they're flooded with worry and question and concern, and they don't get it. They just don't understand. It's like when you're talking, you are the drug. And God is not a drug. The truth is not a drug. It's not a stimulant. It's not going to do anything for you unless you believe it. And there comes a moment when everyone will understand, but... Not everyone will need to, quote-unquote, believe it. That's why it says especially of believers. Because belief and faith, we are believing what we do not perceive. That is what sets us apart from Israel and all of humanity. Is that we have faith that is given to us through Christ. From our conciliated father. We live in a world where people want concrete evidence and they say this is not enough. Well, I know it is enough. There's no hearing without a heralding and that's why I'm putting this out there. This is for members of the body. This is for those that our purpose to hear that maybe have not yet heard and it's all out of love even for those wolves among the sheep there is love for you there is mercy for you God has mercy upon all of his creation even through his indignation God is merciful even through his judgment and correction God is merciful he is gracious with those of his son's body. This is an era of grace. This is an era of understanding. The deception is thick. But it is not even to be compared. The affliction is not to be compared. To the transcendently transcendent Aeonian burden of glory. And the weight of truth. And the density of life. Death is non-existence. Is the lack of life. Life is all. It's the spirit. It is what is animating each of us. It is God. God is life. He is love. He is light. I love you guys. Grace and peace. Stay crush. And this video isn't some aha teaching. It's just straight scripture because sometimes we just need to hear it i know i needed to hear it i needed to say it and it's going out there that it may edify the body and just a reminder you're not alone you have the spirit in you the spirit of god in christ is in you our brother is within us renewing us day by day that we will see him we will literally see him at some point 
it's like it's like we have everything except for the actual physical sight of seeing him that's how real this truth is to us because it is reality it is reality all will see god the invisible god through his perfect image christ and that's us and that is our brother that is the head of the body